session. We are very happy to have Kalim Vibora with us today, who fairly recently uh, moved to Yale uh, from the UC system. At Yale, she's now professor of ethnicity, race, and migration, and also in the uh, women's gender and sexuality studies program. Uh, she's a distinguished contributor to various issues in the, you know, humanities having to do with life, broadly speaking, and, uh, and her uh, wonderful book, Surrogate uh, Humanity, is about our relationship to the robot world, but through, you know, highly informed uh, takes from exactly the fields of research within, within which she has uh, distinguished herself, so a particular take on the function and role within, you know, uh, uh, the dimensions of gender, race, etc., of you know both fantasies and realities, including of course realities of the conditions of production uh, of both uh, robots and the economy, uh, uh, sustaining again both the reality and fantasy worlds uh, of AI at this particular juncture of the problem. That's why we invited her as someone who will contribute to that, and the title obviously speaks uh, immediately. Uh, uh, points immediately in that direction, AI, imaginaries, and the given world. And I'm particularly happy that she will also be joining us at Bonn uh, in our Bonn Cambridge uh, MacArthur program and will spend a month or two uh, with us at Bonn together with one of her uh, co-authors, uh, Leda Antonatoski. They'll both be at Bonn next year where we will be running a summer school, among other things. So, Kalindi, welcome to the new school and looking forward to your keynote. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here um, with us this evening. I want to start by just briefly thanking the Foundation, the Institute for Philosophy and the New Humanities, and particularly Marcus Gabriel for inviting me, and to Alex Englander and Aaron Niebuhr for helping with all of the logistics. So I will start by just mentioning that I'm an interdisciplinary cultural theorist who works between the fields of critical race and ethnic studies and science and technology studies. So that's a lot of disciplines. Um, I've written books about how, as um, in my introduction, I've written books about how the politics of difference and histories of colonialism and capitalism influence the design of new technologies. And to do this, I look at the imaginaries of the engineers. So a little bit different than um, Professor D. Hall's lecture on the social imaginaries. I'm actually looking at what technologists are thinking about as they do their, um, their work. And I use an approach from uh, the field of specifically feminist science and technology studies that brings together history, philosophy, and also social science to think critically about power and hierarchy. In my research, I study examples that you will all have heard of because they're influential, but I also look at small scale examples of what I think of as dissident technologies, projects that will never be taken up by big science and big tech for obvious reasons. They're not marketable, but I think they're important to consider for reasons I hope you'll see by the end of my comments. And also given that we are here together looking at the relationship between the mind and technological artifacts, I've tried to organize a set of provocative artifacts for us to examine together. Um, we've already seen chat GPT in this uh, this week's work, but let me start with it as an example. As scholars and educators, we are being bombarded with concerns and hopes about so-called chatbots, such as GPT represented on my slide, the GPT systems, as well as the Bing chatbot. We're told that these are examples of how AI is going to either revolutionize um, our lives or harm society, never mind, we can say for now, whether or not they are truly AI. And I don't want to spend too much time unpacking how the large language model as a specific type of deep learning system operates, but rather highlight a few details for our consideration. Both GBT and the Bing chatbot are neural networks trained on massive public data sets. They use trillions of parameters to produce text in response to user prompts. They're trained on internet-based textual data. And I've heard anecdotally that the original database was largely derived from Wikipedia and Reddit. So I'll just let you think about this for a moment. Um, the program analyzes the text in the database. And from this, it derives a probability of what word is statistically most likely to come next. By predicting the next word almost instantaneously, 
it can generate text that seems to communicate a response to the user. Another area I investigate in all of my work, and I appreciated this being mentioned in the introduction, is how the fantasy of the ascendance of technology requires human labor to be made invisible. For example, we know that the internet can transmit violent, gruesome, and inhumane material. What if someone asks ChatGPT to answer a question in a way that, pr that provokes it to produce that material? Before it was even open to public use, a Kenya-based data labeling team managed by the San Francisco um, team, sorry, firm Sama, um, and paid extremely low wages, was tasked with filtering out the most duty-based material from the GPT database. This uh, on my slide is Billy Perego's story for the U.S. Time Magazine, which quote, quotes some employees as describing the work as torture. So this slide gives us our first example of how I would like to think about the histories of how technologies materialize in our social worlds. As another example, I want to specifically think about colonial histories and that map that was invoked by the relationship between San Francisco in Kenya. Let me show you first this map is of the maritime route of the ships that were moving commodities such as ivory, gold, pepper, and um, most notably slaves, which of course were um, African peoples captured and dislocated by force to Europe and the Americas. Um, and uh, the main technology of distribution here, of course, was ships and shipping routes, which are marked by the red arrows, red and Oh, sorry, green, orange, and blue arrows. The ships and the shipping routes, as well as the infrastructures, including their ports of call, were the primary technology and infrastructure to move commodities, labor, and information around the planet. Um, and this map is a snapshot of 1650. Compare this to a map of contemporary submarine cables currently moving labor and commodities as data around the globe. The first transatlantic cables were laid in the 1960s for telegraphy, and trans-Pacific cables followed in the early 1900s. By the early 1900s, the British Empire had connected up most of the continents. These were later replaced, these cables were later replaced with fiber optics. The similarity between the two maps marks the ongoing connections between regional and global nodes in a network of power and capital that continues to direct the flow of labor and capital today, but builds upon logics, relationships, and even material infrastructures of the colonial period, kind of proto-globalization. And this sets the map for under, the map underpinning globalization today and the so-called casualization of digital labor, which is part of the story of how Kenya, but also India and the Philippines, which we discussed, I think at lunch on Wednesday, become sites for so-called outsourced work, the outsourced work of content management um, which my colleagues in, in data science call data janitorial work. So to get back to GPT systems and large language models, many of you will remember that before they were fired for their research, Google AI and ethics team members, Tim Nitgebru and Margaret Mitchell, with, along with their co-authors, pointed out that large language-based neural networks reflect the biases of the internet-based language data available. In their March 2021 paper, which is here on my slide, titled On the Danger of Stochastic Parrots, Can, Light, Can Language Models Be Too Big?, the authors articulated their concerns. Large language models, like OpenAI's ChatGPT and Microsoft's Bing Chatbot, do not have access to a large percentage of what humanity knows and believes. This is because they are trained, again, on text-based, internet-accessible material. Think about the many social, cultural, linguistic, and geographic filters that knowledge must pass through in order to become archived on the internet. For example, the models, and this is from the paper, the models overrepresent English, which is a native language of only 5% of the world's population. They reflect the so-called minority world, what others call the global north, therefore promoting a hegemonic vision that excludes people on the margins of what the internet represents as the world. This in turn amplifies the voices of people who are already overrepresented. We can apply philosopher Denise de Silva's question about the ongoing reach of the history of European colonialism here to technologies like GPT to ask, 
what ways of knowing are being annihilated with the scaling of social interactive technologies. Because large language models appear to users as representing real communication and information, they can represent sedimented historical bias and other injustice as fact, and we're seeing this in our student papers already. Finally, because large language models are expensive to update, they present a static world of information that doesn't reflect social change. The world we give to our models, here the parameters of the deep learning system and the data it has access to, represents a, fi a fixed and artificially limited world. My title refers to this given world that we give to the machine system, but also a second sense of the term, the sense of what seems obvious or given about our world. And I'll come back to this. So the hegemonic nature of massified technologies like GPT, I am arguing, participate in a form of world making that exacerbates a longer history of the erasure of cultures, languages, and life worlds, and in fact projects this seemingly given or obvious world onto what is imagined as a collective human future. Many of us are familiar with the important conversations happening in ethnic studies, in science and technology studies, which I'm going to just call feminist STS, and critical data studies about technological racial bias. It's now an established truth that racial and other forms of bias can be inadvertently programmed into algorithms or be lodged in the collection and preparation of data to feed those algorithms, or both. For example, we've seen bias in the outcomes of using large data sets to calculate who qualifies or does not qualify for a loan, what type of loan they are offered, because necessary, um, because necessary hard data doesn't exist for people without stable addresses, without credit scores, and so on. Or we see them in policing, where algorithms are used to calculate who is considered a criminal risk. Predictive analytics are even being used to determine what kind of parole people have eligibility for, above and beyond the judge. So of course, um, we understand that these algorithms and um, biased historical data can cement historical bias. Social scientific critiques of the biased functional outcomes of algorithms are essential because as sociologist Ruha Benjamin notes in her work on the topic, white supremacy, she claims, is the default setting of our society. Black feminist geographer Catherine McKittrick observes, algorithms are anticipatory calculations that tell us what we already know but project it onto the future. So it's another way to think about the question of bias. And then STS scholar Alondra Nelson, who is on my slide, just, who just stepped down after three years as the inaugural deputy director of President Biden's New Science and Society office, points out the need to examine what she calls dangerous social architectures that undergeared scientific progress, and to think critically about the questions we pose in scientific and technical research. She's now at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, well, in Princeton. <laughs> no, we all make this. <laughs> so science and technology studies, or STS, makes the following basic but also controversial assertion. Science is not a practice outside the field of culture, but rather is contained within it. Feminist science studies has added the tenet that for this reason, science and technology can never be assumed to be neutral. One of um, the pioneers in that field, Donna Haraway, uses the term material semiotics to insist that the material world and processes of social meaning making are inextricable. As I mentioned earlier, I'm invested in understanding the imaginaries guiding what turns out to be a rather small and select group of people to design globally high impact technologies like GPT systems. And how then are we to contend with the fact that this small and often non-diverse and almost always commercially motivated, um, these teams have such a scale of material semiotic power. Um, or we can think of it as Gilbert Simondon, the French philosopher and famous teacher of Gilles Deleuze, Bernard Stiegler, Bruno Latour, um, as he argues in his book on the mode of the existence of technological objects, technology is bound up in the ontology of what it is to be human. So feminist STS, again, is more specific. Technoscience always exists within the bounds of a given culture and its values, and it produces them as much as it is produced by them. So in this sense, large language models like 
ChatGPT, and perhaps socially interactive learning machines more generally are an illustration of Niels Bohr's point that in observing the world, we are creating it. The data sets we give to these systems are collections of information translated into binary code. In this way, a world filtered first through human prejudice towards what counts, what is important, and what even bears notice are then molded to fit categories that are meaningful within computable parameters, models. Historian of computer science and STS scholar Stephanie Dick has shown how mathematical models themselves then discipline human behavior. So we make the models, and then the models make us. If, as in the quotation by historian of science here, Hans-Jörg Heinberger, computational models, together with the data they are shaped with, are techno-scientific objects um, that shape what is observed as much as um, they are shaped by it, we must consider the ways that they impact human relations with one another as well as, as our relationships with the technologies. So this is me gathering all the evidence I have that we need to think about this as a reciprocal relationship. Okay, to my next point. Um, so this is quite established in STS that human interactive machines can become infrastructure for how we ourselves become subjects, for how we ourselves understand the meaning of what it is to be human. They argue that our social political context and the material world we take to be empirical, in fact, co-produce one another. In other words, the scientist or engineer receives the material world already filtered through a history of sedimented meaning and interpretation through shared symbols and language. So again, Technoscience is never neutral. Social science and humanities scholarship that centers marginalized viewpoints, such as women of color, indigenous, and black feminism, critique empiricism and point out the danger and in, in inaccuracy of simply taking what seems empirical as always given, because the history of racial hierarchy and gender inequality has skewed our shared system of symbolic reference and languages away from representing those standpoints. So again, if we think about the example of ChatGPT, what has to make it into, through so many filters, into the internet to even become a part of that technology, this is a broader application of that concern. OK, so to take a few steps back in time, um, I want to look at the history of artificial intelligence, since that's one of the themes of our gathering, as a concept in order to think about the conditions under which its design imaginary was established. So some, some start thinking about the history of artificial intelligence with um, René Descartes, who in 1637 wrote Discourse on the Method of Rightly Conducting One's Reason and Seeking the Truth in the Sciences. It posited not only the dualistic view of the mind-body problem, I think therefore I am, but also theorized the mechanization of the mind. It's sometimes read as an early theorization of intelligence and machines, or even an early theorization of the Turing test. Part of the cultural inheritance of artificial intelligence design starts here with materialist thinking and what would become the computational metaphor of the mind. And this is something I don't need to say to a room full of philosophers, but I often do need to tell people who aren't familiar. Um, and by three centuries later, by the 1940s, materialism had been carried forward into the advent of cybernetics alongside computer science as they developed in tandem, both of which flourished amidst the growing scientific cultural norm of understanding information as the basic and fundamental unit and value of all intelligent systems, whether biological or non-biological. So by 1950, Alan Turing's paper, Computing, Machinery, and Intelligence, revisits this issue and posits the question, can a machine think, before going on to develop what he thought could be the definitive test for machine intelligence. This metric sought to determine whether a machine could be, quote, linguistically indistinguishable from a human. Through a series of questions posed by a human judge to a computer in one room and a human participant in another. Soon after, the term artificial intelligence was introduced by John McCarthy in 1956. And um, I think this was mentioned on Wednesday, McCarthy was a mathematics professor at Dartmouth College, long concerned with the possibility of building machines that could reason intelligently. And I think this photo was also featured in Professor DeHall's lecture. McCarthy introduced the, the term at the DARPA-funded, that's important, 
um, Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence, where researchers hypothesized that any aspect of human intelligence could be, quote, precisely described such that a machine can be made to simulate it. This conference set the agenda for AI as a field of inquiry, which, whose stated aim was to draw together a carefully selected group of scientists to determine how machines could be made to not only use language and perform abstract and conceptual reasoning and problem solving, but also for the machines to improve themselves. And so this is the um, concept of, of machine learning systems and neural networks kind of in its nascence. So you'll be familiar with this part of the, the quick historical update. Contemporary research and development in AI reflect the extent to which this research agenda, that is to precisely describe, simulate, and even exceed any aspect of human intelligence as information processing, has dominated the field. For example, in 2016, Google staged a performance of DeepMind's AlphaGo, which used machine learning to su successfully beat the then World Go champion KGA. But in 2017, an article published in Nature by the Google DeepMind team announced that their new version of AlphaGo, called AlphaGo Zero, achieved superhuman performance, defeating the original machine 100 to zero, thus demonstrating that artificial intelligence is widely accepted as a domain through which human reasoning and intelligence capacity might yet be exceeded. And that is the goal always with AI design to exceed what has already been achieved. And I've received, I reviewed this brief history to set us up to think about the geopolitical and cultural specificity of the way that intelligence is conceived, both in terms of its cultural inheritance and in terms of the small and homogenous nature of who was literally in the room during these moments. Um, now I want to consider how this history of AI forwards the imagination of humanity as identical with the post-Enlightenment subject of reason, which is the topic of my co-authored book with Nita Atanasovsky. So in Surrogate Humanity, we argue that many technologies designed to interact socially with humans continue a colonial project, whether intentionally or not, and that is of eradicating non-Northern European worlds and worldviews and replacing them with the seemingly given concepts and values of that particular historical subject. So we start by thinking along with literary theorist and historian Sidia Hartman's book, Scenes of Subjection, which analyzes the problem of human freedom and the liberal citizen subject as this arises out of a specifically U.S. history with slavery. The slave in that context, she argues, was a, or effectively acted as, a surrogate self for the master. The literal master, so this is somewhat apart from the, the Hegelian dialectic use of these terms. So for the master, the surrogate effect of the enslaved person is like a mirror, an imaginative surface, for at understanding their own freedom. How do they understand their own freedom? Through the domination of another who is made to be unfree. I understand my freedom relationally to the unfreedom of the other. Hartman elaborates that these racialized structures of what she calls the surrogate did not simply disappear after emancipation. In our research, we found that social technologies are sometimes being designed in a way that fills a similar role to that surrogate effect. We call this the surrogate effect of technology. So when this mirror that lets me know I'm unfree, I'm sorry, that rather that I am free because of its unfreedom and effectively that I am fully human because it is less than human or it's an inferior human. Um, when that mirror is a social technology, its design can actually influence and reflect who is legible as recognizably free, autonomous and fully human. And this can happen in areas, and this is part of the chapters of the book, as diverse as who counts as a subject of labor, of violence, of exploitation, or even whom is worthy of a valued social relation. And I'm gonna give you some examples in machine, machine intelligence to materialize this a little bit. So one of the examples we talk about is um, an important prototype in the world of social robotics. And this robot on my slide is Kismet who might look familiar to any of you who watched U.S. public 
television programs in the 1990s for children. Kismet was very famous. Um, it was really a breakthrough in social robotics completed by Cynthia Brazil in the late 1990s. She was and still is a faculty member at MIT's Story Media Lab and um, was the student of Rodney Brooks, for those of you who know who that is. Kismet was designed on a model of infant caregiver interaction and programmed with affective drives. So Kismet being the juvenile and the human being the caregiver. Um, programmed with affective drives. And in her technical papers on the project, Brazil describes Kismet as being designed on the basis of her understanding of the basic neural architecture of primitive human emotion. Her source for this understanding of human primitive emotion um, was Charles Darwin's book, 1872 book, titled The Expression of the, Emotion of the Emotions in Man and Animals, in which Darwin proposed that the, quote, emotive signaling functions of humans were selected for during the course of evolution because of their communicative efficacy. Sounds like Darwin, right? Kismet's program, um, programming and structure are organized around the processors, input devices, and hardware required to animate its face. Its program drives, which are indeed modeled on Darwin's biological drives, determines the robot's performance of an affective state. And these are the um, states that it can perform on my slide. We argue in the book that Brazil's reliance on Darwin's thinking about evolution and emotion illustrates the often unintentional ways that historically European cultural prejudices, now global again, thanks to this history of colonialism, become built into techno-science infrastructures. Darwin's writing on emotion and evolution precisely captures the moment when modern scientific knowledge establishes a culturally specific notion of the human, again, the post-enlightenment, liberal, modern European subject, as self-identical with the category of the human as a biological fact. So Charles Darwin's writing about human emotions in the 1870s influenced the design of Brazil's social robotics prototype much later in the 1990s. Her choice to design a robot that would interact with humans from the position of a juvenile or primitive human also illustrates a larger phenomenon we track in surrogate humanity. That is how technologies are often designed to underwrite a feeling of mastery and autonomy in the human user. And again, to go back to that um, surrogate effect, this happens through a mirroring where we experience our relative freedom, autonomy, and mastery through the reduced same in the mirror technology. So scholarship theorizing the advent, advent of the liberal subject explains that this understanding of the human is a historical product. As we all know, Across time, human cultures have had diverse notions of what makes us human. And not only do these change over time, but they are diverse historically in any given time period around the globe. So post-colonial theory has explained that part of the colonial project was enforcing this version of the human onto all of that diversity, thereby erasing cultural, linguistic, and religious life worlds and cosmologies, among its many other material and epistemological violences. So in our book, we explain that the post-Enlightenment idea of the human, the so-called liberal subject, which you will know is defined by its self-sovereignty um, or autonomy, becomes an important part of how technologies designed for human interaction are imagined. So just to explain a little bit more deeply about how this comes out in Darwin, in his book on my slide, he um, describes those as... Uh, deprived of reason like animals, the insane, and races distant from European man as becoming brute in character because they are reduced to base emotion. They are affectable in a way that Europeans have overcome through civilization. He explains that these primordial habits of so-called affectability are the basis of our evolution as a species, but are now vestigial. And this is part of the evidence that European Civilization represents the apex of humanity in Darwin's thinking. This institutes what contemporary philosopher and black feminist scholar Sylvia Winter calls the ontology of man, 
and the ongoingness of the colonial scientific project. So to bring this back to Kismet, Brazil's approach to emotionally expressive robots equates evolution with the ability to perform the existence of an interior psyche to the exterior world. Kismet is designed to affirm the superiority of the human subject who interacts with it by performing a lack of interiority, like those so-called primordial, primitive, or juvenile humans. Why is this a problem? Because the lack, this lack of interiority is, again, the crystallization of this colonial premise that presumed primitive peoples could not screen their performance of emotion. And this is also a kind of very simplified version of what the philosopher of global race, Denise de Silva, calls the transparency thesis. So our emotions, Kismet's emotions must be transparent because it is a mark of civilization and evolution to be able to screen or filter and have interiority, right? So that's part of this universalized human subject. We have interiority. So, um, which I know some philosophers don't agree with. <laughs> some of the um, people thinking in cognitive science also don't agree with, but Kismet was a prototype for a large-scale technological infrastructure in social robotics. Um, and since she has launched several projects derived from this prototype that are intended to become mass-produced consumer items, and we there's some examples in the book for those that are interested, and these are you know modeled on the idea of something like Alexa, and so these would be scaled examples of technologies that are affirming the humanity of the user by assuring them of their autonomy and superiority. Um, okay, so this history is just one very small example, but illustrates why we should pay careful attention to how machines designed to interact with humans build in the concept of the human in their design, as well as what these designs assume about the givenness of the world around those interactions. And these are just some contemporary examples of autonomous commercial humanoid robot prototypes. We have um, in the US, Boston Dynamics Atlas, in Japan, Robot Labs Pepper, and in China, the UBTech Walker X. So um, as STS scholar of human machine interaction, Lucy Suchman argues, in the development of interactive machines, ideas about the world and the bodies that move around in the world are seen as given. In other words, as we discussed in regard to GPT, the world is a static and pre-given entity when, once it's given to the machine. Also, as with GPT and the broader realm of technologies we deem AI, we understand these to be autonomous, at least within the parameters in which they're designed. However, as Suchman points out, in reality, it's only when human labor and its alignments with non-human components are made invisible that a seemingly autonomous technology can come to exist. So think back to the Kenyan subcontractors that make GPT largely what it is through content management. So throughout surrogate humanity, we also take up what I would call dissident technological design imaginaries. These are projects that explore the possibilities of technology to break from historically sedimented dynamics of freedom and unfreedom um, and other dynamics woven through this um, fantasy that I've been elaborating. So just as a couple of examples, some of you read about this one. One example is a creative AI design meant to draw attention to and critique some of the things taken as given in machine intelligence design. This project is called OMO from a larger work titled Machine Therapy by a MIT trained roboticist, Jane Kelly Dobson, who uh, left the world of engineering to become an artist and still builds robots. The machine therapy project includes designs as a whole that challenge the superiority and autonomy of the humans they interact with through, and this is her description, an experience of care that is designed to require mutuality and independence. So you can oppose that to the autonomy and mastery um, of other machines. <clears throat> Dobson ro Dobson's robots um, are specifically designed as a critique of existing prototypes in mainstream care and companion robots, like Pearl the Nurse Bot here on my slide, who is a car Carnegie Mellon and University of Pittsburgh collaboration that's designed for nursing facilities. She argues, Dobson argues, that robots like Pearl are imagined to replace human caregivers, relatives, and companions 
yet are designed only to dispense medications, take biometrics, and engage the patient through brief surveys like the ones we all get when we show up to a clinic, right? Are you in pain, et cetera, et cetera. This is important because, she argues, as people interact with and reflect from these caring machines, they are, in fact, being trained on what is now considered caring and soothing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dobson argues that companion robots imagined to replace human positions are modeled to represent a whole person or creature and so seem like a human replacement. They're designed to be normatizing. They're also intended to help people meet a narrow range of socially accepted achievements. So she criticizes this norm um, or this design norm in that these bots are not meant to present their own anxieties and neuroses, but simply to comfort, serve, and survey. So she built OMO to be experienced as not its own entity, but as being in between its own being and a part of oneself. And um, this is to push back against the troping of other care robots as pets, nurses, or in some of the descriptions of these companion robots, they're meant to replace adult children or grandchildren in the social lives of the um, nursing home inhabitants. Okay, so I'm gonna play a video Dobson's video of Omo interacting with various entities while I read this next part. <clears throat> as you can see, Omo is constructed as a football-shaped orb, and the springy surface is meant to feel like skin. It expands and contracts at a variable rate, and the volume of the expansion and contraction is programmed to vary in response to the stimulus of pressure from another object touching it, <clears throat> whether that object is breathing, so the, pr the pressure of lungs, or vibrating, which you'll see in a moment, um, it's sitting on an electric dryer. So Omo can follow a pattern or lead it. And <clears throat> she describes Omo as a transitional object, saying it may sometimes effortlessly and smoothly seem like a part of the person holding it, and at other times the person may perceive it as a separate object, as its own beings. In some situations, it may behave like an organism, a creature, or a sympathetic friend or pet but it is designed to intentionally not be stably such. It's designed, it is not designed to be a servant employee machine like Pearl the nurse bot, but rather has errors and noise programmed into its um, operating system that lead it to sometimes act erratically and possibly break down. This critique is interesting because human functional equivalents like companion robots both reflect and shape fantasies of human otherness. And as people interact with these caring machines, we are in effect being trained into a new understanding of care. And this can shift our definitions of care, much as our definitions of what it means to work or labor shift first, shifted first with industrialization and later with digitization. So again, I'm illustrating the way that we think of humans as designing machines, but also bringing back those other scholars who have argued that in fact, machines also shape who and what we are as humans in a society. As another example, I'm sharing a speculative AI design whose author team brings together cognitive and computer scientists with a Mahayana Buddhist philosopher. They propose the design of intelligent machine agent, an AI, whose programming challenges established norms in both algorithmic structure and rational categorization. The authors emphasize that if intelligence is defined as functional problem solving, learning, and creative responses to challenges, then it does not require a brain and can take place outside of the traditional 3D space of motile behavior. So they're setting the parameters for their understanding of intelligence. With this expansive definition, they posit the question of how we might both develop formal ways to develop uh, formal ways to design diverse intelligences, as well as how to recognize and relate to them. The authors say that the goal of such a design would be to create a moral terrain in which natural life forms and human designed agents could all be understood as engaging human moral duty. The paper defines intelligence regardless of substrate, animal, human, machine, intelligence as goal-derived or goal-dependent, and being able to reach a goal despite changing circumstances and challenges. So if this is our 
definition of, again, intelligence, goal-directed activity is the main way that machine system autonomy has been understood. And as I mentioned earlier, since the 1940s, um, wh while cybernetics and computer science were coming up side by side, there has been study of communication and automatic control systems in both machines and living systems understood, under, living things understood as systems. So this part of the paper in itself is not novel. They're not diverging from established computer science understandings when they say that another way to frame the idea of reaching the goal while simultaneously reducing stress on the system could be a way to broadly define intelligences. So goal dependent, but also reducing stress on the system. But here is where the authors take a turn I think is really interesting. <clears throat> they say, however, the Western philosophical investment in the hard divide between brain, body, and environment has prevented an understanding of intelligence outside the brain mind. We can debate this later if you want. Um, but the AI design becomes an interesting thought experiment because they argue that if intelligent agents are now the domain of computer science, bioengineering, and cognitive science, then Buddhist philosophy articulates well with this new dissolving of the brain-body-environment divide. So they're saying something has changed in the science of intelligence, and it correlates well with Buddhist philosophy. Specifically, they argue or they propose designing intelligence agents, AIs, around a Buddhist-derived definition of care as the driving principle. So let's go back to that generalized understanding of intelligence. If stress on a system is defined as the difference between current versus optimal conditions, then they argue advanced intelligence includes the ability to notice agency and thus stress and seek its reduction. They assert that care can thus motivate such an intelligence. The authors suggest that care can be defined as, quote, concern for stress relief and intelligence as the degree of capacity for identifying and seeking such relief. They say the greater the intelligence, the greater the capacity to care about more things. They reference the tradition of the Bodhisattva vow in Mahayana Buddhism, in which a person makes a commitment of compassion to relieve all suffering across the divide of human and non-human. And the rest of the paper outlines an expansive cognitive science and computer science explanation of such an advanced intelligence based on what they call a philosophy of infinite care. <clears throat> Feminist science studies scholars have worked towards similar goals in other terrains. Most relatedly, Catherine Hale's pursuit of cognition as the shared and interpenetrating capacity of both biological and machine systems to act in the world, recognizing that as the extension and counterpoint to human cognition, machine cognition may be the most important technological agent to theorize and track for feminists. Her approach also decenters thinking from intelligence, as well as assumptions of autonomy or even subjects. Instead, in complement to other feminist STS scholars, Hales's approach to cognition is through biological machine assemblages rather than agents and relationality rather than autonomy as crucial interventions. So the authors of the Infinite Care AI paper assert that such a care-based AI would allow for the recognition of an ability to relate to diverse intelligences, including and extending beyond the human. So this is where that sort of expansive moral terrain they gesture to comes through. They argue that it is necessary in light of the coming together of bioengineering, artificial intelligence programming, and human cognitive science in the near future when they predict we will be engineering new forms of machine, biological, hybrid intelligent agents. By centering a non-Western, and this is where I'm going to experiment with some thinking with you, by centering a non-Western episteme and value system that engages a Buddhist philosophical value of infinite care, the concept paper attempts to suspend the givenness of the rational and hierarchical agent of intelligence that continues to shape the world we give to machine agents. <clears throat> For me, it highlights the potential of decolonizing computer frameworks, which Anita C. Chan has argued highlight another potential, not only in recognizing the diverse vibrancy of existing challenges to digital universal models, 
um, but in cultivating knowledge practices that indeed foster a decentering of the self as a generative asset towards the creative co-production of alternative futures. Instead of a conclusion, and I don't have the time on my, so I still have a little time? Okay. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> All right, so instead of a conclusion, as requested at lunch on Wednesday, I'll share an example of how I've tried to make practical applications of some of these theoretical critiques in terms of bridging feminist STS with actual STEM practice. So um, this first slide represents a project that I started in 2017 after I had become, just first become the director of what's called the Feminist Research Institute. And one of the mandates of that institute was to serve the whole campus and to focus on STEM fields, which in the U.S. is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And so what we had to do before tackling anything was to educate our colleagues uh, about the goals of contemporary feminist scholarship. Uh, as you can imagine, many faculty in STEM did not feel that a feminist research institute had anything to do with their own work, though they might appreciate the need to increase representation in their fields. So we started by surveying participants across STEM fields in a year-long workshop, and we asked people to share at all levels, PhD, established faculty researchers, to share their sense of what are the challenges to socially just science and what are their visions of socially just science. And it was interesting because many people came into the sciences with a vision that science can do good. And slowly over time, because of the challenges listed on this kind of reddish colored ideogram, they gave up some of those hopes. <clears throat> so after we surveyed these participants in our first year workshop, we proposed a curricular intervention for PhD students that was funded by the National Science Foundation, which has a program called Innovations in Graduate Education. And we developed a curriculum which is available online along with videos that um, talk through some of the material for anyone who's interested. And in, in the curriculum, we emphasize that feminist inquiry is not simply about women or even gender, but is more appropriately described as research into how power operates in a situation, a given situation. And that to understand how power is operating, we must understand power within a historical and global context at the same time that we're attentive to the specificity of where we are when we're doing our analysis. So in our article on this project, our kind of preliminary findings, we describe this as the need to connect demographic diversity, having more diverse, a diversity of people in the room, to epistemological diversity different ways of knowing. So going back to the beginning of my talk, how do you create a practical application of this idea that worldviews are being excluded and even erased through our development of new technologies? Well, if we think about the epistemological diversity available by bringing people into conversations, such as remember the picture of the Dartmouth summer research program, what would AI look like now if that room had been populated differently? This is a question we can ask in the context of this curriculum. It applies a wide range of feminist STS scholarship to exploring the extent to which even changing the initial research question that one pursues um, and research agendas to account for the observer's own cultural context can contribute to the desire of many science PhDs to do good with the science that they um, are learning. And we give them a framework to create more equitable research gen agendas through interdisciplinary work with humanities, social sciences, and the arts, which I know is of interest to many of you here. And we give them tools that include recognizing historical bias, placing research in a broader social context, and working with communities in developing their research questions and protocols. And I can talk about you know, this example more but the idea is that the training goes beyond an examination of bias and addresses how the premise of what is considered a valid research question or even valid ways of gaining knowledge can seem like innocuous sites of exclusion. Okay, so I'm going to pause and invite your questions and discussions. Thank you.
Okay, so if you don't mind, I'll share this for you. Then you can just concentrate on the cockpit. Sure. Yeah, that's okay. That's, that's great. Okay, it's Deborah. So, what do Labeling. I actually think that we cannot combine into a universalist view. And if it came across that I was looking for such a thing, then I've made an error in the way I've presented. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is most apparent. For example, if you look at some of the critiques of the framework of universal human rights, it's doing important work that we need done in the world. And it's also excluding many, many people who don't have access to rights, right? So it's like this, it's like we need a common ground for global governance or what have you, but we also need to constantly hold that as insufficient because of this problem, which is we have divergent and often non-contiguous ways of understanding personhood, what is um, you know, human dignity, et cetera. But we also need to have, we need to contend with the fact that many people around the world have access to things like chat GPT, and it's doing, it's changing infrastructure. So we have to hold both at the same time. And where do we have it, I would ask. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think this is, I, I may be misunderstanding you. But I think part of what I'm trying to point to and what we're trying to point to in the book is that if we're here in this room, the chances are we've gone through a process of becoming a human subject in a way that makes us generally agree with one another. But that may not be true once we step outside of the rarefied spaces of you know, the academy or the urban global north. Or So what I'm saying is that there are many people on this planet who might not agree with us or we might not agree with one another. So what do we do about creating large techno-scientific systems that then affect all of those people? What is the ethics there? Is that? Yeah, I think I think if uh, Deborah is saying, if I understand you correctly, let's see, right, that this mm -hmm. question uh, presupposes precisely the universal ground on which we stand. What matter does, right? Because otherwise, what's the reason for any change in normative orientation. So if it were the case that, uh, you know, indeed um, value representations are generated and that's a fact about humans, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that uh, should be undisputed, that value representations, so what people value, differs in indefinitely many ways, right? And then we know how this comes about through, among other things, the type of work uh, that you're drawing on. That should not us to saying, well, then this is how things are, 
because if we said this is how things are, right, then we have no normative function saying something like, what are we doing in distributing something that has a local origin across, say, right, deep anthropological borders. Right? So the position of critique or normative orientation, uh, without thereby specifying it further, right, relies on universalist assumptions, which is not per se an objection, but it means something like, you know, I think, is that a fair enough way of? Yeah, okay, I didn't know where you were, I just wanted to try to read something into, but I thought that, yeah. That's, so for instance, when we say equality and we measure lack of equality, right, then we don't want to say that, uh, that you know, Buddhist philosophy is what we now, the ground we need to stand on. Because yeah, I was not Western saying, will say, right, no, no. Why non-Western, also like how, as, some, as a Western, I could say, no, that's just offensive to be hmm. non-Western. I don't want non-Western. The Buddhist example is really yeah, just sure. a thought experiment in helping us understand how specific what we have really is. So the that the AI we have now is culturally specific, just like the Buddhist paper owns its cultural specificity, yet the mainstream models we have of AI, which not only mostly come out of MIT and Stanford, but really was a very small group of people, they don't own the cultural specificity. So how do we then contend with the power that they have? This is my question. It's about power. So it's not that the Buddhist example is better or should replace, but rather it's to open up our mind to the fact that these are all highly specific, and yet some get universalized and others don't. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's fair, right? It's a critique of a false universal, right, of which we saw some Stanford Buddhist example. I'm not saying that. Okay, so Inga, <laughs> were you here Wednesday morning? I was. Yeah. Okay. okay. Quite yeah. Interesting. Uh, that, uh, in so many ways, uh, you should have interacted then. Like, uh, uh, it would have been great because it was a, a very stark example. Yeah. Right. Uh, kind of, uh, of what you are saying. Right? Interesting. Just an empirical proof of something that's known. Right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Okay, Inga. Would, they, would you say, would this work, you mean the critique of epistemic violence? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So most of the work of post-colonial theory, and particularly deconstructivists like Gayatri Spivak, Ali Baba, is arguing just this, that the primary residual effect of European territorial colonialism is the ongoing effects of the epistemic, what Denise De, De Silva calls the annihilation of life worlds, right? So um, yeah, so any place you have English being taught as a national language, like India, for example, where it wasn't an organic language from that place, we can think of that as ongoing, um, but also other representational forms um, visual representational forms um, or, you know, gestural communication, all of these things I think would be encompassed in that critique, yes, definitely. 
Yeah, I mean, I think a kind of version of radical redistribution of representation of who's actually making social infrastructure, governance policies, technology designs, that's the only way that we can address, I mean, pointing out bias, as you say, is something you do from, first of all, hindsight, for the most part, though, you know, in a room like this, again, it, the people who aren't in this room can answer this question better than I can, right? So there's a way in which I can think outside of my formation as a subject, but I am still a product of the same, you know, what um, Anibal Quijano, who's a decolonial thinker from Latin America, calls the coloniality of modernity. Right? We're in it. Um, so, right, so there's a kind of, it's interesting in a lot of post-colonial thought, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with the work of Franz Fanon, but his argument is that you must completely eradicate everything that's here and rebuild, right? Like the people who have been oppressed, colonized, et cetera, are the ones who need to design the new humanity. And he actually puts it in term of replace man with a new kind of man. Sylvia Winter, too, she, in her work on decolonial thought, actually talks about man one and man two. Right, man one being this social scientific product of, you know, the coming together of the age of colonialism and the age of scientific exploration, right? This both ontological scientific human um, to have something else. You can't just kind of gently modify what we've already got, right? There needs to be a kind of radical otherness introduced. Um, how to do that, I think, is not one person's domain, right? But I do think, you know, just to bring it back to that pragmatic process paper we wrote for the science journal, it, it's really about representation. It's about what worldviews get to participate in design. It's one way to kind of think about it. Is that, am I answering your question? No, I think um, perhaps it became too binary to say there's bad AI and there's good AI, but that wasn't what I was intending at all. It was just a kind of, I often use counter examples of experiment, like especially speculative technology design to point out what people in mainstream design aren't thinking about. Not that they're, these are the answer. Like I don't think Omo, the squishy green robot is like, someone once asked me if that was my feminist ideal of a robot, and I said, no, no, <laughs> it's just good to think with. It's just good to think with. Well, just an example, right, of extending the scale mm. of the lens. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, ben, you have a question. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it was very good to up and it's very useful things, but I guess I could have better ask a question, which uh, for my research, I can uh, ask myself whether to speak down. To uh, what drawing on human labor in the production of AI, which I think is really important. I don't know if you uh, heard about the concept of the machine learning sandwich, where like the red side are the data processing and the deployment and monitoring is 97%, and the meat is the monitoring. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was introduced by Catherine Dong in a, um, I think, some blog article. And uh, in the a book by Michaela White called "Like Everything Is Dying Has a Moving Power." Um, they link this to where the big tech jobs in AI are, and of course they're <coughs> on the left, on the sorry, in, in the wrong building mm -hmm. about the great people of Berkeley and Yale, and the red sides are on the other operationalized. Um, yeah, and I think you can put this in further and. Racialized um, and uh, sexist um, discrimination um, yeah, contributes to the distribution of these jobs. And um, this is yeah, a remark which um, I think is really helpful tool to the automation of AI. And yeah, I, I got this concept from the uh, book by Maya White. 
On this topic, we are functionally agnostic, and so too are we in Spanish. So, for their analysis, um, Machine Fundament Consciousness does not play a role, and my subject here to introduce some different um, model of intelligence, but do you think all this, um, yeah, is this analysis uh, still possible, like just the possibility of functional thinking at the risk, or it can I think I'm with uh, I'm with Rodney Brooks, who's Cynthia Brazil's teacher, and that it's uh, and I guess with well with other philosophers as well, the, the consciousness part is it's, it's it's outside the kind of analysis for me because what I'm really interested in, if it didn't come through in the talk, is the humans, the human impact of the technologies. And the book Surrogate Humanity, we talk about. Um, discourses around automation and the replacement of human labor and looking at the reality of which jobs are being replaced by automation versus which ones are not. And sometimes it's actually better to talk about automation instead of AI. I think it just brings everything down to a more practical level. Um, so, for example, we talk about what are called collaborative robotics or cobots, which is a field that was initiated by Rodney Brooks, who is a kind of He's got a really interesting approach to intelligent machines. Rather than thinking about a brain box and a central processing unit, um, do any of you know Rodney Brooks's work at all? So he is thinking about each kind of sensor in the machine as its own kind of knowledge <clears throat> producer, information um, producer. And so he's also very um, he's been working very much in swarm robotics, so looking at insects and swarms of insects as a model of intelligence. And I think that David Chalmers was talking about this, right? The distributed cognition. So you don't actually have to have um, intelligence, like a singular intelligence or definitely not consciousness to achieve most of the things that you need to do in automation. Um, and cobots are really interesting because Rodney Brooks got the idea after going to, um, do you know what the Roomba vacuum is? So this is Rodney Brooks's commercial brainchild. Um, this is automated vacuum robot many people have in their house, produced in China. So he went to the Chinese factory and he thought, you know, this Chinese labor, these Chinese workers are going to get expensive someday. I need to think about how to automate this. And this is in his own paper. Like this is Rodney Brooks representing himself. And that was what gave him the idea of the cobot, which is not meant to replace a human worker, but to be an interactive um, worker with other humans, but is imagined specifically to replace, as we say in surrogate humanity, the sort of lower valued, understood to be less human workers, right? We, we, the kind of workers that Rodney Brooks doesn't really feel like are part of his concern. And so well, the question for me is, how do people get to the point where certain parts of the world, peoples don't merit full personhood? And this is what I was, and others do. Like you said, in the sandwich, the middle folks who are doing the creative, innovative work, right, the modeling, um, the design, how will they protect themselves basically in these designs? And also why do we continue to reproduce these notions? They're not biased exactly. I would call them imaginaries of whole populations of people as disposable. I think this is an, an important thing that we don't always talk about in the topic, you know, in the topic of technology. Okay, then. Next on the list, uh, a question on, uh, the, on coloniality, right? So, uh, which of course takes many shapes, and you have been emphasizing the, the, the coming into being of, you know, the modern uh, socioeconomic infrastructure, right, mm -hmm. with all its dimensions. And uh, uh, um, I think that, you know, it would be important to add a layer of, uh, uh, in order to, you know, in the name of a politics of difference, as I myself call it in my work on the universal, a layer of insight into how widespread colonial conditions in the flow are, right? Just to give you our local born example, right? The next big city is called Cologne, which means colony, mm -hmm. right? Uh, born is a good city, <clears throat> and it's a beautiful city, all that names. Then, you know, the Romans, of course, entered and colonized Europe. So that's, and, you know, empire, etc. right? That's also a colonial condition. Mm -hmm. 
uh, then there are various colonial conditions in the place we now know as Africa, right? The role that Egypt, ancient mm -hmm. Egypt played, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So I'm just giving, you know, and similar things uh, would have to be said about, you know, humanity everywhere. So if we look, take a long durée view, right? Then of course we can say that there's something that is outside, like in any meaningful way. As soon as we have any historical documents of human behavior, we will have colonial conditions, right? And this has nothing in particular to, to do with Europe, which also didn't exist at the time mm -hmm. when you know we can start describing the activity as colonial, right? The types of socioeconomic networks that you have been characterizing couldn't have been European in any sense because that was not an entity. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just bringing this in in order to say there's also difference in colonialities. And, uh, and when we create a, what I find is a problematic world is called Western, and non-Western, then the problem is not so much by bringing in, in, in uh, at the point of bringing in serious multi-perspectivity, which is the minimal value, I think, of you know, achieving insight into the colonial conditions of mm -hmm. the present moment. But the problem is that we might be generating, uh, generating a fantasy of the mm -hmm. West, right? So that's a focus, uh, because the West, too, is a fully colonized place, right? Just think of obvious stuff like genocide, you know, mm -hmm. the German case. Uh, uh, or colonial movements within the space we now think of as, say, German, which is, by the way, already a colonial term, right? The, uh, when we speak about Germany, uh, it's Caesar, right, who conquered the space mm -hmm. and gave us Tebello Gallico, right? Um, so, like, a particular take on what's going on in these worlds, right? Plus various other interesting colonial maneuvers I re read in this wonderful book, highly, very highly recommended by Tyson Caporta, he's an Aboriginal think in Australia, etc. He lives out there, but everyone's, uh, you know, he comes to the city to teach his course. Interesting book, Sand Talk, in which he tells the story of the coming into being of modern, the modern research university, which was a German idea through the Prussians. I didn't know there was like mm. an um, indigenous group, the Kusai, they were called, right, Slavic language, mm. in the parts of northeastern what's now Germany, Poland, Russia, right? This is where they were living, and then some German, more southern tribes entered this space in modernity and eradicated them and called them Prussians, right? And this was a very militant, militant group, right? So quite, I'm just saying, you know, yada, 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 right? So uh, what, I, what I want to say is that coloniality, I think, is more difficult to grasp than I think the idea that it has something in particular to do with Europe, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm deconstructing the way, yeah. the networks, all of the facts are there exactly in the way, so that's not really a critique. But I'm just saying that it might be, you know, like also as a European, because this is a, a much of post-colonial discourse in the mm -hmm. US in particular, often it talks about Europe, right? And then as a European, I get quite nervous by this because I don't have no clue what that could be. So I think Europe right now is also like to use the case given different positionalities. I think what's called Europe, often in uh, English-speaking discourse, is also a colonial product of the U.S., mm -hmm. right, uh, playing a particular role in the setup now. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, But anyhow, so what do you think about that, right? So yeah. how can we think about the so-called West without in any way assuming a unity where there ain't any, because the so-called West is the origin of a recognition of diversity. The recognition of diversity does not happen in India, and it does not happen in China, and it also doesn't happen in Africa, right? So uh, while I fully agree that the false universal is what we need to overcome, mm -hmm. I think that very idea, right, couldn't have been there without the liberal tradition and the Enlightenment. Yeah, so my response would be twofold. But you've heard the yeah, no, I mean, I'm very so interested in, yeah. um, and I think maybe the critique that is corresponding to the language of colonialism in my talk really is honed in on the creation of a global ontology of the human yeah. as a scientific fact. That yes. was, I think, inarguably part of the age of scientific exploration and colonialism, which was happening on the literal same ships, right? The scientists, so, and those ships originated in parts of the globe that are now identified in the region of Europe. At the same time, in a different talk, I could discuss one of the ways that many scholars, including some of those same post-colonial scholars like Gayatri Suvak, but also people like Silvia Federici have talked about, and actually even Deleuze and Guattari talk about the million plateaus of the subject. Like we have internal 
colonization of subjects within ourselves, we can think of it that way. And one way that I teach that to my students is thinking through Federici's understanding of Europe and particularly the pogroms against women who were well-established in society as healers, as counselors, and as um, spiritual leaders. And this was part of the institutionalization of medicine, law, and the church. And so there were these internal eradications, like the witch burning, right, as a way to expand these institutions of governmentality. So I think, um, and also I know a number of people who work on the internal colonization of Europe in my field of critical race and ethnic studies. Um, and so I will think about whether the use of the language, you know, I, I think the language of the West is always very difficult because some of us feel like we are of and not of the West. Exactly. But what would you suggest in place in order to get at this unprecedented phenomena where we had the entirety, arguably not the entirety, but at least geographically of the globe affected by this idea that was posed as universal, which is there is a scientific category of the human. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think the facts, like I would absolutely not neither dispute the fact of this uh, and the importance of the event that you're characterizing, right? Nor, as it were, the causal details. I think this is all correct. Um, but if we, if we give it like this value-laden name, right, then indeed we don't see its operation on itself, all right? The cannibalist dimension of it and all of that. Uh, mm. So I have no clue. I think we need a new term mm. in order, because otherwise we move, you know, inside into an opposition where it shouldn't belong, right? We don't want to say, I think this came out uh, immediately in parts of the discussion, right? We can't say that this is bad, right? The colonial, uh, you know, the, the false universal, unless we have a grip on the true universal. Because if we give up on the idea of the universal, so many people I work with in Asia in particular now speak of universalizing mm -hmm. instead of the universal, right? right? Or in contemporary Chinese philosophy, there's this term co-becoming, human co-becoming, uh, in Chinese and kyose in, in Japanese, and that's a, a translation into Chinese of uh, symbiosis. Mm. Um, uh, so that, that term is symbiosis. And instead of transformation, there's this whole thought of transformation economics, you know, they speak of metamorphosis, right, to find out, you know, to come up with a different way of thinking about what's happening, right? Now, what they suggest is therefore to say, you know, the false universal needs to be replaced by a true universal, and the true universal will have these local elements, right? So it's, uh, it's something that we need to create, that's, you know, so, but still you have, you know, you're, you're putting yourself in the position of the universal. For otherwise, right, so imagine, uh, you know, someone who would hear the story could just say, hey, cool, right? There's this wonderful Western European or whatever colonial infrastructure, gives us AI, uh, uh, gives us capitalism. Uh, and now that we know this, right, and that we know that the universal in it is bad, we just own, right, the regional dimension of it and, go, uh, and say, well, that's great, so we need this in order to, and uh, that's like contemporary talk that you will get in this called West, right? Uh, first thing I heard after the war of Uk against Ukraine began actually from someone who should know, I won't mention her name in Stanford. She said, uh, well, now you guys in Germany, now you finally know why there are worse things than Western capitalism. Right? That's a remarkable way of reacting to this. So that's what I'm just saying. There's a danger that, uh, uh, socioeconomically speaking, the type of insight that derives right, from very important research such as yours can then easily be exploited if we don't occupy a universal position, hmm. right? That's, that's uh, I think that, that it's just an add-on, right? But that's certainly not going back to the false universal whose falsity has now been made explicit over the last decades. But cannot the universal position be yeah. one of non-certitude, like? hundred percent. Okay. Absolutely. Then we're on the same page. <laughs> you know, like, uh, 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 it will require a vocabulary of a different type, what you call radical otherness, right? It will require vocabularies of vulnerability, embodiment, etc. All of this is true. All feminist insights, post-colonial insights, right? Everything that is just an insight, right, has to be fused into that stance, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and that is, you know, it's hyper-complex, 
it's not given, I like, you know, the, mm. the certain rejection of given this, all of this, I think, will then be true about this. Right. Interesting. Uh, mm. uh, um, but why, you know, why give, as it were, an opponent the universal stance? Mm -hmm. You never want to argue against human rights, right? Because otherwise, it's like very simple. People will just say, oh, you're against human rights, right? You can't wind up with that position. Right. You know? Because mm. you're for human plus rights, right? Where you have, we have a better understanding of the human and the plurality. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. Maybe it's just a strategic way of putting things, but also bringing in, as I said, the internal mm. coloniality yeah. Inter interesting, uh, of yeah. the place which then indeed did all the things or spread in exactly the ways in which this went. Okay, I have uh, you on the list. I have you. Sorry, I don't know your name. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not part of the semantics. Fine, I'm just saying the order in person, right? So that everybody knows you. Paul, Lydia, Jonas, and then Carla. Yeah. So excuse my ignorance of the previous discussion. And it follows on quite directly from what was said previously and the question of Paul uh, related to the question of we need not be committed, however implicit, to however weak the universal to make such stances. And I would like to make just very clear that this is a great challenge. It has helped me anyway to be thinking about the opposition as a tool for approaching That's interesting. I think when I put together talks for an audience that's diverse in terms of its training, my approach is usually to bring out a number of pieces for discussion um, and to present them as a non-expert on the artifact, but rather the thing that I know about is underneath it, the critique, right? And so to help people understand the critique, it's often better to show an outside to the problem. And so, for example, what Kelly Dobson's OMO, the green orb, does is it illustrates something that we might not think about the givenness of social robotics, which is what if you, what happens when we don't have any neurodivergent interactant machines? What happens to us, right? And who is us, you know, I'm not trying to universalize there. What happens to the person interacting with the machine? And in fact, she goes beyond that to say what happens when we think in the binary of human machines. So she builds a machine that also offers therapeutic services to other machines and to animals. And so I think one of the themes through the talk is that the otherness that we need to include in our thinking includes this category of the human, which is the heart of my critique, right? And so I, 
am a mere anthropologist. I'm not a philosopher. So to under, if I understand correctly what you're saying about the two approaches, I don't think of them as, for me, they're not opposed. They work together in this way. And I think it's because my goal isn't to come to a final resting point or resolution, but rather to say we are in a processual state together. And the reason I uh, ended with this kind of pragmatic project that I was working on is that all I know is that things have to change and that I am not an engineer. And I will unlikely, I'm unlikely to be in those rooms like in the Dartmouth Summer School in this lifetime. And so some of my students may be in these programs that we do to help bridge those disciplinary divides. And so what if some of the people who would have dropped out, I mean, and this is a very, I mean, we all get, we get a bit tired of the diversity narratives, like the diversity and inclusion narratives in our institutions. But what if we actually thought about this as an epistemologically urgent project, not just you know, to diversify our spaces, but we actually have to diversify this problem of the given world. Um, so for me, it's, that's why I said it's, it's non-certitude in that sense. Like I don't know where we're, I'm not necessarily moving towards universal, even though I recognize that you can't not have them. <laughs> um, but it's also not my domain as someone who studies culture to come up with it. Is that? <laughs> I mean, I entirely agree with that to the point In the chapter, Seems maybe to be 
maybe to license like kind of violence that I would be worried about. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what you think about. It. Yeah, no, I think it's very interesting. And in that, in the chapter that you all read, it was just outside the scope of the argument to pursue what shame in particular does. And actually, Elizabeth Wilson thinks a little bit about it in the Affect and AI book, I'm reading Sylvan Tompkins' work. But um, I have two things. First of all, thank you for walking us through that. I, I agree with you. I think that it's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of recognition of emotion between different agents and whether they're human or non-human. Um, and in a later chapter in the book, five or six, we talk about empathy and this kind of preoccupation that people have with empathy being the thing that makes something or someone really human. And so can a machine have empathy if it's not conscious? Can a machine have empathy if it cannot feel? These are kind of some of the questions that come up. And so we talked through some examples, but there's the same fear historically that you talked about with replacing the lack of with, um, how did you phrase it, a more morally questionable emotion. So this has happened historically between humans, right? And so Cydia Hartman writes about how this happened, again, in the context of slavery. And so it was a very, you know, we were very careful about thinking about the otherness discourse that comes from, again, this specific US history, at least when we're talking about Atlantic slavery, and how it comes to shape our notions in this country, not just socially, but also legally of personhood, and who counts as a person worthy of relation, which was one of the questions I raised in my talk. And empathy is an important part of that, and reading empathy is highly cultural. So um, even the idea that a blush indicates shame across cultures or that an action motivates shame across cultures is a problem, right? So regardless or, uh, or not, you know, regardless of whether you can physically produce a blush is kind of a separate question. And I'm thinking about this. I'm not going to work on this. I hope someone else will. Um, facial recognition of emotions, which is the most, I would say, well-funded part of advertising technologies that's happening right now so that our, you know, our cameras and our devices can look at our faces and identify emotion when we're looking at advertisements. And that information is very valuable, as you can imagine. That technology is going to be used for all kinds of things, not just advertising. So, and already, you know, well, anyway, we can talk about policing as well, but I think that you're right. I think that this has historical precedent for doing exactly what you said. Yeah. Sorry. I'm now wondering, just a question, but maybe later, like, are there, do blushes exist? I never observed one, right? Uh, 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 it's, you know, like in the sense of color, right? I mean, now that you point out the obvious being interesting, et cetera, also in your paper, I'm really wondering if there are such things, right? Uh, I haven't observed one, right? I, I mean, can't remember if I... With a person, like, as white as me, and then, and then, you know, you can see me being ashamed, and then there's, like, a literal blush. I'm just wondering, to the... the uh, <laughs> I will try to observe. I haven't been out for blushes, like you know, so my blush detectors, like, my blush detectors, among other things, right? I mean, I can't even get to see Vidya as not blushing, right? Or blushing, if ever again, you know, like I don't have the concept for this, but okay, anyhow, so I'm just wondering, you know, like how much of this is social construct. Hmm. Okay, good, but if Paul says he blushes, then I blush. So, have I blushed? statistics that's 
much as just get the data and then solve the problem, but it's not really just about the design and process itself. And uh, so I just wanted to stress that point and I really thank you for your question. Yeah, I appreciate that very much. And that's something that in terms of my ethnographic work, I haven't had a chance to really talk to people about so much that that's the next thing that I hope to do is hear more about design at that level. Um, the data part, I think we can all understand at some, you know, this, ra I mean, again, radical decontextualization of something to produce it as a certain kind of information. But Stephanie Dick's work on the history of mathematical modeling is really interesting because it, at a, at a level that I can understand not being someone who could design an algorithm, explains how models consistently do a certain kind of delimiting of the world and then feed that back to the person using them, right? And so there's a lot of stories of um, people who create the models, and I think algorithms as well, where you're constantly tweaking the data to make it work, to make it work, right? And if it's a model, then it should work, but it won't, right? So the human is actually doing all this labor to make it a functional model. And I think that's really interesting in terms of thinking about not just bias, but again, <clears throat> my argument, not that there should be a new universal value, but rather we need to think about how we're interacting with these, yeah. And maybe just one more comment, it's also that the people with certain Australian accounts, they want, of course, to be more similar, because then it's easier for the models to be pervasive. That's a really good point. And power, which is actually one of the most similar tasks to be more similar, because then it's easier to see. Yeah, this is a good point. Yes, that is a good point. Uh, okay, uh, Carla, hard to resist not to jump out on this, but you know, like a, let me try to get back to moderator and blushing already. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. Very fascinating. So, um, yeah, I have a like maybe uh, a little question. Um, you were saying. Yeah, and I will answer you at the same level of pragmatism, which is community-based design and community-based research would answer that question. So instead of designing at the level of the most expansive market and profit you can get, which is, you know, again, the Silicon Valley comment, this is the drive, is to capture venture capital. To capture venture capital, you have to promote a fantasy that people want to buy into, and to get people to want to buy into it, they have to identify it with a viable consuming um, class. And so the problem is, you know, who's going to design those robots? There's no market for a diversity of robots. Um, but if there was another model, and I'm more of a materialist thinker than this is why the universal question, I understand it, but I can't really speak to it, um, is to scale everything down, which requires defeating a kind of capitalist infrastructure. Um, and I went back to this because, you know, the main challenges that come up are um, about money and resources. People want to do all kinds of things, but they can't get the lab, they can't get the um, funding to do the research. And so um, I think having smaller scale technologies, and there are really great examples of this that I teach in my classes. So even in um, gaming, so there's this wonderful game called Never Alone that was developed for a specific Alaskan Native community in consultation with the community members and what they needed. And what they needed was to promote language acquisition among the young people and the preservation of the knowledge of elders. And so this is all built into the game, um, which wasn't meant to sell. 
outside of that community. It was by and for this community with the intervention of people with the techno, technical knowledge. And so there are these examples, and you know, I sometimes talk about that one, but um, they're not scalable for the most part. And so that's something to think about. Again, just, I appreciate practical questions. I think that's kind of how we move towards the larger universal understanding of what is then the universal. Yeah. have a nice answer for this, I hope. So actually, there are a number of scientists who are involved in this project and many like it. And I have the privilege of getting to talk to them regularly. And um, not only that, but I've had PhD students come up with brilliant interventions that the argument is, and we were talking about this the other day, that there are actually interventions that make science more objective, what Sandra Harding calls strong objectivity, um, the idea that any single observer is only going to have weak objectivity, right? You're an individual observer. And this is supposed to be accounted for in the um, scientific method through creating something reproducible. If it's reproducible, then that's supposed to cancel bias. But what um, another, you probably know Donna Haraway's work, she proposes the model of partial perspectives, which is that if we each have a piece of the truth, then the more pieces we bring together, so there's an underlying argument for, again, a, a certain kind of diversity, the closer we get to scientific accuracy, understanding that we'll never have perfect objectivity. And so this makes sense to people in lab science. And um, I think what are some of the things that have come out of it, so I have a colleague in the University of California system, Linda Sesson, and she actually was saying that she knows a number of biologists who agree that not only is categorization as a tool a problem um, because of its colonial inheritance, right? Taxonomy was a tool of colonization. Many of the categories of biology were created in the same way that Darwin's understanding of primitive drives were. Um, but it actually makes for clumsy science, right? So there are many things happening in the natural world that don't fit categories. And so the trick is to help people understand that this kind of critique can actually improve their scientific outcomes. The most difficult 
audience I found, is this still being recorded? <laughs> um, no, is, yeah, okay. I was taking some of the things of the <laughs> for this one, but uh, <laughs> also some things I'm I don't want anyone to have hurt feelings so when I say no, this. No, we'll, okay, we'll cut from this. The hardest sell are engineers, believe it or not. Um, so it's, you know, you, it seems like, oh, and com computer engineering should be like, okay, such a practical place. But no, actually, it's people who can see the path towards actually deeper scientific inquiry and more refined results through questioning their own powers of observation. So I actually do, yeah. myself yeah. so well that's interesting because you know one thing people will say is sure all of this like re um, relativism is accurate to a point like we can question but then we get to the laws of physics and we can't question anymore but actually there are physicists who don't agree with that so once again I think the trick is to find people who are in the in at least relatable fields not the same kind of physicists uh, maybe but um, who can speak in a way I cannot. Um, so for example, some of you may know Karen Brad's work on quantum mechanics. Karen is a, a faculty in a gender studies department like I am at University of California, Santa Cruz. And so Karen is someone who can actually do some of that translational work and does in fact in Meeting the Universe Halfway. And the new project is on quantum field theory as I understand. And so there are some questions about the laws of physics there that Barad takes on from a feminist perspective. So I do think it's possible. I personally cannot do it. <laughs> OK, last but not least, uh, sorry, I know for time is at that page, but I want to wrap up. Yeah. OK. You will join us later for the dinner, right? My, it will Good. be my pleasure. Yeah, this yeah. gives us more occasion. But uh, yeah, okay. last question, official. That's an interesting question. So at least in the examples we looked at in surrogate humanity, we found that the part of um, structures of inequality, or if we want to call them that, like histories of racialization, of gendering, of ableism, that just they get transposed. They don't go away even when the body of the machine suggests that they should. So another way of putting that is the problem is that the reason we assign care to the robots in the first place is we already don't think it's very important, that work, right? And so this is actually the topic of my first book called Life Support. It thinks about technology and outsourcing and how certain kinds of work get deemed as less valuable. And it certainly informs the work in surrogate humanity. But I think you have to do both, right? You can't just replace people with robotics and expect the social structure underneath it to change. It will somewhat. But um, as Dobson says, you know, the machine is already being built with a notion that care isn't very important. It's just dispensing medicines. It's just taking your temperature. It's just being a physical presence in the room in case your vital signs should go awry. Right? That's enough to replace an adult child, a grandchild, a pet, a friend, a nurse. 
And so it's that imagination that's the problem. So that wouldn't change just by taking away some of the labor. And that's true, I think, in all automation. So to an extent, I think the answer to your question is yes, it could have an impact, but it's not going to be as much change as you would hope. Well, thanks, Kalindi.